If I had to pick one thing that he passed along, it would have to be his work ethic. He just wants to be greater every day, and all of his sons are the same way. They never rest on their laurels. It's always about, I need to work harder, I need to get it. They respected the fact that their father earned a living and raised them through music. I sort of drifted into the music. I was too slow to run track, too short to play basketball, and too light to play football. And, and music was the only thing that was left for me. During the early, early years of my life, there was only one radio station that played music. And I really liked the Gramercy Five, Audie Shaw's group. And I started to take private lessons at the Xavier University Junior School of Music. There was no jazz being taught, no jazz being discussed, no jazz allowed. My daddy didn't care nothing about music of any kind. His concept of a musician was a guy on the corner with a jug of wine and a woman on his arm. <laughs> he didn't change his mind until he watched me become a piano player as an adult, really. When I think of Ellis, I think of New Orleans music coming to a crossroads. And Ellis represents modernism and change in New Orleans music. And, and if we didn't have him, we would be at a deep loss, I think. He understands the entire structure of the music, from the traditions to what's happening on a contemporary basis. He's not locked in in any one way, and yet he's developed his own style and his own sound. But whether he's playing Muscat Rambo or one of Monk's tunes, it doesn't make any difference. The individuality of Ellis comes through. You couldn't rebel against him. Y'all played in a funk band, he was like, yeah, man, he came and played with the band and played hipper than what we was playing. One musician in particular he knew in New Orleans, he would say, well, I never wanted to play this crap anyway. My, my father made me. With such bitterness, he says, this music is hard enough to play when you like it. He says, it's not, it's not gonna come from me. It has to come from you. My dad, he just said, well, we'll see what happens. You reap what you sow. Like my mom would stay after us, not only to practice, but to do our homework. She was the glue that held the whole family together. Because trying to be a jazz musician in New Orleans is kind of ridiculous in any way. And he would take me with him and stuff. So I always went to all the gigs. From when I was two or three, I was always on the scene. The encouragement for me just came in watching them. And I liked the way they interacted with each other. I think a lot of what determined what we did professionally was the fact that we grew up in a town where being a musician is actually associated with masculinity. I got a call from Al Hertz by joining his band. It was a chance for us to pay a few bills and also learning about how business and music was conducted at a much higher end than dealing with gangster club owners in New Orleans. You know, when he was playing in the early 60s, he didn't think that he was ever going to be a teacher. I mean, he eventually did that to support his family, but then he started to see the importance of it. His specialty was dealing with hard-headed kids because he had so many of them in his house. You could get the worst kids in New Orleans, and you, but my daddy was, because he loved them, too. He would teach the art of discovery, not to tell you what to do, but to try to make it to where you would figure out what it is that you would have to do. He stuck Winton and I in the classical section. <laughs> I had weaknesses I had to address, and with my personality being the way it is, I needed to be forced to deal with it, and classical music was going to do that for me. You always felt like Ellis was singling you out, which was a great thing, but also very intimidating because you felt like you were his only student. That was scary because he's such a thorough musician that you can't really hide. He put a lot of emphasis on being able to hear. Like, he, you had to listen to stuff, John Coltrane, Giant Steps. He said, what did you hear? Well, man, you know, you started with a lot of your knows, and then he would say, what did you hear? growls, bends, inflections, twists, leaning back on a phrase, moving ahead on a phrase, none of that can be transcribed. And I always tell students, they can bring in pop music, they can bring in jazz, classical, they can bring in anything, and we try to analyze it from an oral standpoint of view. And I'm saying, what do you hear? I learned so much from my dad. I had one series that was on TV, and he called me up to you stealing all my stuff. <laughs> I mean, every one of them is academically brilliant and musically just so astute. It's very inspiring for a guy like me. It was always hard for me to kind of celebrate my own kids, because I could still see all them kids who, they don't even get a chance to learn the fundamentals of music. With the exception of a handful of students, most of the music students come in and have never heard a jazz record. We want everybody to have jazz in their life. 
The fact that so many individuals can come to a decisive conclusion but still maintain their individuality is the great thing about jazz.